Good morning. And it's Kansas. Howdy, y'all. We were having a discussion the other day about how Europeans or people from other countries make American accents. It's neither like surfer dude or cowboy. I, I, most people here seem to do cowboy. It's okay, I'm not even gonna attempt an Irish accent because I'm just not good at accents. So um, thank you so much for coming today and I'm so just thrilled and honored to be here. Um, thanks to Grania and Ursula and Brian for just reaching out to me and um, I remember getting the email and being like, you want me to talk? I was looking around for like, was that, was that email just sent to me? Because I'm, I'm a young female, kind of early in my career, but I've made it my passion to not only treat fibromyalgia patients in my clinic, but also research the condition because um, I, I, I it's about 80% of what I do clinically, uh, and it has really inspired me, and um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. The title of my talk is Fibromyalgia, From Fiction to Fact into the Future. So briefly, uh, the objectives of the, the talk today, I don't wanna call it a lecture, because I feel like lectures are for doctors, for boring people. Talks are for fun people, like patients. Um, so what is fibromyalgia? We're going to kind of go over, I know that Ursula just did a great job outlining fibromyalgia, but we're going to dig a little bit deeper in terms of some of the research that's out there to support the mechanisms. Um, we're going to explore the evolution of the concept and diagnosis of fibromyalgia, look at some of the current medical understanding of how people develop fibromyalgia, and discuss old and new treatment therapies. I need my pointer. All right, before I get started, and thank you again for that wonderful introduction. I'm gonna just tell you a little bit about my journey because I, I find it best to just talk to you like I'm a person. Yeah, I'm a doctor, whatever. I'm, I'm also just Andrea. And I think that it's important you get to know a little bit about me before I share some more medical information. So who am I? How did I get here? Well, they, they were correct. I did get my, my degree from the University of Kansas. This, is, this isn't actually a real bird. I'm just gonna throw that out there. <laughs> this is called a Jayhawk, and that's the mascot of the school that I went to. So it's a mythical beast, a little mythical bird, but we love Jayhawks. I mean, they're all over my house, and, and it's super fun. But that's where I went for undergraduate studies, where I got a BS in um, human biology, and I also did my medical degree at the University of Kansas. And as young people do, um, they decide they want to go away from where they grew up. You know, I'm just going to rebel and get, go away from my parents. I also kind of fell in love with a dude who lived in California. So that's how I ended up in Los Angeles. And there I did my training in anesthesiology, and I got a fellowship in pain ma management there, and I also did my research degree as well. Interestingly, though, and I don't know how it is here in Ireland, but I've had a chance to talk to people, and it sounds to me that pain physicians, people who are trained in pain medicine, are similar to how I was essentially reared in terms of pain medicine techniques. Do you guys know what this picture is? This is a picture of a spine injection. This is an epidural injection. This is what I was really trained to do. So when I you know, joined my pain fellowship program, I literally thought that for the rest of my career, I'd be sticking needles in people's spines to try and make their pain better from like a disc herniation. It wasn't really until I started uh, seeing patients on my own as an attending that I started seeing more and more patients with fibromyalgia. And when I was trained, it was kind of like, I'm just gonna say it, it was like the F word, right? Pain doctors are frightened of fibromyalgia because it's challenging, it's complex. And you know what? Doctors just, they, when they don't understand something or they don't know how to treat something, their ego gets a little bit bruised and they just don't wanna take it on because doctors always have to be the smartest person in the room, right? That's kind of how we are. I'm not, but I must be some sort of unicorn. I don't know. Anyways, what I like to tell patients is I didn't find fibromyalgia. I wasn't out looking to treat this condition. It found me, and I'm so glad it did. I do feel that it is my destiny to take care of patients with fibromyalgia and research this condition and learn more about how patients, why they're suffering and how to treat it. 
uh, because as we all know, at the current state, there's no cure for this. And right now, doctors really in their toolkits don't even have that much to be able to help this condition, nor are we guided by any sort of principles on how to treat each person individually. How many of you have been to a doctor and they're like, well, you have fibromyalgia, we might as well try this one drug, right? And then when that doesn't work, what do they say? We'll try another, and we'll try another, and we'll try another, and we'll try another. Fibromyalgia patients are not, there's not, there's not like a cookie cutter that makes you guys, right? You guys all have fibromyalgia for different reasons. And so we need to learn through research how to look at a patient, understand why that individual has fibromyalgia, and then treat them with personalized care so that you don't feel that you're on this never ending rolling down the hill of a snowball of trying to figure out how to treat yourself. The process of trying one drug and trying another and try to try to try, aren't you guys, it exhausts you, right? What you're just trying to get relief and after trying drug after drug after drug, some people give up hope and I see a lot of patients in my clinic who are literally like, I've tried everything and I'm still not better. What can you do for me? And I hope that I can inspire you today with what we're gonna be talking about, how you can advocate for yourselves in your physician's offices with information. And so there's good information in this talk. I'm also gonna to provide to Arthritis Ireland and Fibro Ireland some handouts and journal articles that hopefully they can upload to their website for you to get more information. I have a really great article that's written by my, my mentor, my research uh, mentor. His name is Dr. Daniel Claw at the University of Michigan. He has a wonderful, wonderful article that was published in the best journal in the United States called the Journal of the American Medical Association, or JAMA. That article, I literally print it out, bring it to your doctor. It outlines everything that they should be looking towards treating you with. So, all right, now we're gonna get into some science. Is that okay with everybody? Okay, enough about me. Let's talk about you guys. So what is fibromyalgia? As Ursula explained so well, it is a chronic pain syndrome that is essentially uh, seen with widespread pain as well as associated symptoms. And those associated symptoms are things like mood alterations, depression or anxiety, as well as sleep disrupt disruption. Who here has trouble sleeping? I do too, but it's because I have like two crazy children. <laughs> And then cognitive difficulties. And honestly, sleep is one of the most important problems to, to manage because we all know that with good restorative sleep, our brain is helping kind of replenish these neurotransmitters that are known to be um, helpful in combating pain. So sleep helps actually treat pain from a very molecular standpoint, but if you're not getting that restorative sleep, then it feeds into the pain and it turns into a vicious cycle. So I'm really glad to hear that they are doing workshops for you guys today on sleep uh, and sleep hygiene. So a little bit more information. So who here was diagnosed by a rheumatologist? Okay, most people. So. It's considered a rheumatologic condition, which is why most rheumatologists are those who that, that uh, diagnose it and treat it. Um, but as we'll talk in the coming slides, it's not really a rheumatologic condition. It can coexist with it. People who have lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or other autoimmune conditions can get fibromyalgia. But if you look at the etiology of fibromyalgia, it's not a true autoimmune or rheumatologic condition. Um, but it's the second most common. Arthritis is obviously the, the number one uh, rheumatologic condition. The prevalence is reported at about two to eight percent of the population. And patients with fibromyalgia typically have lifelong histories of chronic pain anywhere throughout their body. Um, it may start in childhood with migraines or abdominal pain, and then progress as you get older to more widespread pain. That's very typical for this condition. Um, and who here has migratory pain where one week it's in your back, the next week's worse in your neck, then it's the knee, yeah. very, very common. So it's very uh, common for it to migrate and have it not be in one place all of the time. So we're gonna move on and talk quickly about risk factors. So patients 
will come to me and I spend a lot of time trying to garner their history of pain. And I spend a lot of time asking about the family. And the reason is, is that there's a lot of patients who maybe had that aunt or that grandma who had really horrible pain, but this was like before fibromyalgia was recognized. And oh yeah, I remember so-and-so, like they always had chronic pain, it was hard to treat, but you know, they just had it and that was it. So I always ask about family members, but one of the main things is if you have a first degree relative with fibromyalgia, you yourself are eight times more likely to develop the condition. So there is a strong genetic component to this. And they've actually looked at twins, you know, identical twins, they share the same makeup. You would think if they share the same genetic makeup, they both should have the condition. Well, they found that's not the case. It's about 50% genetic and 50% environmental risk factors. So women are more likely than men to develop this condition. If you look around the room, mostly ladies, and I don't know if the men here actually have fibromyalgia themselves or if they are here to support their partner, but I, I wanna say like, I'm gonna salute the dudes in the room, especially those who came here to support your spouse. I think that's just wonderful. Uh, it can develop at any age. Who here had it in childhood or adolescence? Who developed it as like a young adult around university age? Who developed it later on in life around menopause? So you can see it can happen at any time. And I hope you guys are okay with that. I like a really interactive talk here. I don't want to feel like I'm talking at you. And if at any time during the, the talk you want me to clarify anything, please just shout it out and I will clarify. Um, we do know, however, that something called secondary fibromyalgia can occur. So there are people who have primary fibromyalgia, which comes on really without you know, having any history of it or having any of the risk factors. But secondary fibromyalgia is about 10 to 30% of people with autoimmune conditions like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, those types of syndromes develop fibromyalgia. And we call it secondary because it's usually related to the underlying rheumatologic condition. Who here has stress? <laughs> yeah. And we in America are like super stressed out, but it's mostly because of our president. Um, <laughs> I had to. Don't you guys feel like you just don't know with an American like which side they're on? <laughs> just have to, you guys know what side I'm on. It. <laughs> Anyways, stress. Stress can cause fibromyalgia and it definitely worsens the condition. So stress management is a very, very important part of taking care of yourself and managing the pain. And that can be psychological stress, but can also be physical stress as well. Um, severe acute pain episodes. So some people get fibromyalgia because they have a really significant physical insult or injury. Um, there are people I've seen who were in horrific car accidents and ended up having like 10 or 11 surgeries to fix the broken bones and all of the other things that had happened as a result of the car accident. And people can develop fibromyalgia after that because if you think about it, you broke your whole body, you had to have all these surgeries. That's nothing but tons and tons of pain hitting your brain and spinal cord all day long for however long that initial injury is occurring. That in and of itself can cause the brain and the spinal cord to become more sensitive to pain. Uh, Lyme's disease, as you mentioned previously, has been linked to uh, fibromyalgia. Uh, I see a lot of our veterans, so if you weren't maybe aware for like the last 10 years, America's been at war. We see a lot of these young, young men who've been overseas and deployed to Afghanistan and, and all of the Middle East coming back with similar symptoms. So I see a large male fibromyalgia population, but their fibromyalgia is coming from essentially trauma, PTSD from what they've seen when they've been at war. And then something that we kind of explored on the tweet chat the other night, I don't know if any of you guys were on the tweet chat, but lifetime history of trauma. And I get into this with all of my patients. I don't need to know specifics, but I ask, throughout your lifetime, have you ever been traumatized? We see it more with childhood trauma, and it can be physical, emotional, or sexual abuse. Neglect, just being in a house and not being recognized, that's very stressful on a young developing person. Or even growing up in a chaotic home environment where maybe there's drug or alcohol abuse being given, uh, done by the caretakers. 
So we know based on human and even animal research that early life stress or even stress during adulthood can or trauma can cause fibromyalgia. Who here was touched on these points to get their diagnosis? A good majority of you guys? Yeah. This is the 1990 American College of Rheumatology criteria for fibromyalgia diagnosis. You have to touch on all these points. If you get 11 or more, then yeah, sure, you have fibromyalgia. Back then, this was like in the 60s and 70s when they were starting to recognize this, they called it fibromyositis or fibrositis or even worse, psychogenic rheumatism, which essentially, this was a bunch of white old men doctors saying, you ladies are crazy, right? So not cool. Back then, they really didn't know what was causing this. And they did, they did their best. They thought, well, we see this a lot in our arthritic patients. This must be inflammatory. But we know over time that that's actually not the case. So since about the late 1980s, we know that this is not a condition, at least not in those who don't have a coexisting rheumatologic or autoimmune condition, that fibromyalgia primary is not associated with widespread inflammation. It's chronic widespread pain. If you look at these points on the previous slide, if I touch those points on me, it hurts. I mean, everybody has pain in these areas. These are just more tender spots for everyone. But people with fibromyalgia, they hurt wherever you touch them. It doesn't matter which point you touch. Any of that, it's basically like circle the body, <laughs> touch anywhere on here and I'm gonna hurt. But what we know now with good research, and we're about to get into it, is that fibromyalgia is essentially a final common pathway wherein your pain is actually being generated and maintained by your central nervous system. And by the central nervous system, I mean your brain and your spinal cord. And it's not just pain. We know now that everybody with fibromyalgia has other symptoms. It's more than just pain. It's sleep disruption. It's cognitive difficulties. Who's heard of fibro fog? Right? I have patients come in and they'll be like, I just can't tell you the word. I'm looking for the word. Or I have had patients who are like, I got lost in Target. And I don't know if you know what Target is, but Target's kind of like a, a big fun store where you go and you spend too much money. You went there for milk and you come out with like $200 worth of stuff. They do it on purpose. What we know now is that fibromyalgia is a fairly well understood condition and process that's independent okay, from psychological factors. I'm gonna make that very clear. You are not making this up, and it is not being caused because you have depression or anxiety, okay? Those are downstream effects of the pain. So I'm gonna use the term centralized pain syndrome. I don't even really like the term fibromyalgia, just because it insinuates that something's wrong in your muscles and your fibers, and we know that's not the case. Centralized pain syndromes, as I discussed earlier, are those types of pain syndromes wherein your central nervous system is doing one of a couple things. It's either taking input from your peripheral nervous system, which is all the nerves outside that go to your arms and your legs and all of your intestines and your, your organs. It takes that and then the brain amplifies it. So that's one way you can have a centralized pain syndrome. Another one is that your brain and your spinal cord could actually be generating that pain in that part of your body without anything going on out there. So we call the kind where it starts out here and your brain amplifies it, we call that bottom up centralization. When the brain's making the pain down there and nothing's going on in your knee or in your back or your hip, that's top down. So there's two different types and research is actually ongoing right now to try and figure out how we as physicians can delineate what type a person has. As you can see here, I really love this Venn diagram. All of these conditions are known to coexist and have the same type of etiology. So if you are a fibromyalgia patient, you likely have one of these or more other conditions. Things like interstitial cystitis, which is now being called painful bladder syndrome, endometriosis, irritable bowel syndrome, temporomandibular disorder, migraines. All of these things are, have been shown with good research to be similar in how they are perpetuated and maintained to fibromyalgia. All right, I kind of stole this from Dan Claw. Again, he's like, to me, he's like the, 
the guru, kind of like the sen wise sensei of fibromyalgia. And this is how I explain it to patients in my clinic. How many of you, when you saw your doctors, felt that they did a good job explaining to you your condition? A couple? That's good. Most don't. I try and use an analogy of an amplifier and your body being a guitar to explain this to people. So amplifiers can be turned up or down or they can kind of just be off and not doing anything. But your body, so the pink guitar, and I'm being a little sexist, pink is fibromyalgia body, okay? Blue is just a normal, healthy person. When you plug in the pink guitar to the amplifier and you strum the strings, and the strumming of the strings could just be you sitting around, it could be you know, someone trying to give you a hug, it could be stubbing your toe, and it, or it could be having surgery. A fibromyalgia brain, or amplifier, has that volume knob turned up way high. It's letting a lot of sound through. Someone who has a blue guitar, who has a normal brain and central nervous system, those people, if their strings get strummed or they have some, someone hug them, the, the amplifier is not gonna pick that up. So do you, does, does that make sense? Your volume knob on pain in your brain is just cranked way up. So treating it is about turning the knob down. It's that easy, but not. <laughs> I know, I could totally like win the Nobel Prize if I could figure that out. Okay, so I like this distribution here. I, I took, again, I took this slide actually from my, my mentor. We all exist on a bell-shaped curve of how sensitive we are to painful stimulus. I personally am kind of a wimp. Like, I am very sensitive to pain. I've actually done the quantitative sensory testing techniques to see what my pain thresholds are. And I'm, I'm kind of, pain sensitive. So I'm, I'm probably like kind of around here, meaning that this percent of the population, if you look at this, this is tenderness, the higher it is, the more people are like that. So people over here on this right side are typically what you would say are fibromyalgia patients. So these are people who have a heightened pain response to a painful stimulus, or as some of you may experience, you actually have pain from non-painful stimulus. Someone's shaking your hand someone giving you a hug or even just kind of grabbing your arm to get your attention, that that can hurt. That is, that is that amplification, okay? That's that knob being turned way up. We know now that it's likely set by genes or genetics as well as being modified, and again, I can't go into it in too much detail, but your body's stress response system is continually activated in patients with fibromyalgia. So what we know about patients is, have you ever heard the term fight or flight? That sympathetic response, it's like on for fibromyalgia patients all of the time. It's why sleep is so difficult. You can't tap into that thing that's, you know, brings you to the zen, zen place, right? So the higher your volume control setting, the more pain you will experience, irrespective of what that peripheral input is. Who here has seen this? Oh. You had on the previous page, you had also sensory stimulation. Mm -hmm. That means whatever. Yep, like it can be any type of stimulus. From autism. For some people, it's the heat. For others, it's, the, it's too, too much light. Yep. Or for others, just... And what we're learning, what we're learning from, yeah, what we're learning from good research right now is that it's a global hypersensitivity. So pain is just part of it. A lot of good researchers I've been working with are looking at how people with fibromyalgia have, um, odor, like they're very sensitive to smells, like for perfumes and things like that. Um, they have uh, very much sensitivity to bright lights or flashing lights. And, and sounds can bother them. And I, like, I'm, I'm a noisy American. I tend to like talk a little too loud and you know, I'm like the annoying person at the airport, right? <laughs> People with fibromyalgia tend to, I've had to kind of tone down my voice when I see patients with fibromyalgia and talk in a much more gentle, soft voice because people with fibromyalgia are definitely more sensitive to that loud, boisterous noise. So this here is actually how your doctors should be diagnosing fibromyalgia, okay? 
This is the 2010 American College of Rheumatology um, fibromyalgia survey criteria. And it's essentially a survey that you can take yourself. You don't need to be touched to have the diagnosis of fibromyalgia given to you. What matters is that you have widespread pain and that you have the associated symptoms we've talked about so much. And I'm gonna, this comes in that article from the Journal of American Medical Association. You can actually take the survey yourself, score it yourself, and find out what your number is. In order to meet criteria for fibromyalgia, you have to have a score of 13 or more. You get 12 total points from the top of this. You get 19 total points from the widespread pain index. It gives you a score ranging from zero to 31. And unfortunately it's cutting off, but it should say fibromyalgia-ness. <laughs> yes, it's a real medical term. It's actually been published in articles. It means how fibromyalgia are you? Are you a little fibromyalgia, a lot fibromyalgia? I like to joke, it's not really a joke, but I like to say, Everybody has a little bit of fibromyalgia in them. And I've taken this survey, I take it regularly because I like to see where I fall compared to my patients. And if I'm stressed out or if I'm anxious or have going through some you know, personal stuff that might not be fun, I take this survey. And there are times that my score has been as high as 10 because I'm stressed, because I'm starting to have symptoms. Yes? So could you please repeat where we can get this? I'm going to send it to uh, Arthritis Ireland and Fiber Island, and they're going to be hopefully uploading it on their website. Thank you. you are very welcome. So anyways, this number gives you a sense of where you fall on this continuum of fibromyalgia. But what's important to note is that fibromyalgia is kind of the tip of the iceberg, because as I mentioned, people can take the survey and have evidence of centralization of their pain, but not meet criteria for fibromyalgia. So Ursula touched on it a little bit, but I spend a lot of time talking to my patients about how their pain from their fibromyalgia affects them. You guys all look delightful, right? You look healthy. People look at you and they say, you don't hurt. And they say, well, why do you hurt so bad? You look fine. Who here feels isolated from friends and family or from anybody really, because people don't look at them and understand. That's hard, it's really, really hard. And I hate hearing those stories about patients who, their family members, you know, say, don't come to the party because we don't want people to bring you down, you know, you to bring people down with your pain. I mean, that, that's just, it's really sad. And I think as a physician, like I said, I was trained to just come in and be like, yeah, you have a disc herniation, yeah, we can get you an injection and maybe you'll feel better. That was how I was trained. I've had to learn over time on my own how to assess and treat fibromyalgia through reading and through talking with mentors and experts. But I think what me being a fibromyalgia specialist has allowed me to do is become more of a human and have more compassion when I see my patients. And it's so important for me to understand on a very human level, more than just pain and where does it hurt and trying to figure things out, understand how that pain is really, really, as a human, affecting my patients and even sometimes how it affects me when I'm seeing patients. I think for you guys and for most fibromyalgia patients, it's really hard to find the right provider. I've been informed that most people here get treated by rheumatologists, is that correct? So you don't even get that. in the United States, rheumatologists won't even see it anymore. Our own rheumatology clinic at my hospital, if they get a referral for fibromyalgia, they won't schedule it. How sad is that? I am the only person in the greater Kansas City area who will see fibromyalgia patients. And I am a pain medicine doctor. Most pain medicine doctors, like I said, they want to do the injections. They want to just see the patients. It's like a, vi a veritable factory of, t of you know, seeing people and making money. I would rather personally take my time with patients. And so I'm very lucky that my institution has supported me in my, my mission to make sure that fibromyalgia patients get seen and get heard. And by being heard, it means you get time. And how many of you feel like your doctors don't have time for you? 
And I think that's just kind of an overarching problem, right? Doctors have a lot of pressure to see more patients and do more. But I think it's an honest disservice to patients. And I, again, as I said before, many practitioners are challenged because they don't understand it and they don't know how to treat it and it's very challenging and difficult. And a lot of them aren't up to date on the current research. And this is just a little summary box of kind of what we already talked about, but I think in the interest of time, I'm gonna keep going. So pathophysiology is a fancy medical word for what's actually seen that's causing the pain, okay? So what we know about patients with fibromyalgia using quantitative sensory testing techniques. So this, these are like little machines that can actually elicit pain from the patient. It allows us to measure a threshold for how sensitive you are. So it's not fun to do, but we have learned from good research that patients with fibromyalgia have lowered pain thresholds on sensory testing compared to healthy controls. And then as I'm gonna show you in a little bit, there's actually a lot of research going on where they use imaging techniques using MRI scans to basically elicit pain in a fibromyalgia patient inside of an MRI scanner and watch how the brain gets activated. So we'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, a lot of the abnormalities that we see, not only the pain, but the depression, the trouble sleeping, come from altered neurotransmitters such as norepinephrine and serotonin in your brain. And that is why you're having problems with those things is because typically there's a lack of those neurotransmitters. Who's been told this? Right? My patients tell me that all the time. And it actually is. It's in your brain, okay? This was the seminal paper that proved that fibromyalgia brains process pain differently than people who do not have fibromyalgia. This legitimizes your condition. No one can look at you and say that you don't have fibromyalgia. If they take an MRI of your brain and press on your thumbnail while you're in the scanner and make you hurt, your brain regions that are pro-pain will light up like a Christmas tree compared to someone who doesn't have fibromyalgia. Also, your brain, the, the processing of it, will reduce the amount of neural transmission to the anti-pain regions. So your brain's just, like I said, that volume knob's cranked up. It's doing everything it can to promote pain. And that's why the treatment of fibromyalgia is to help turn down that hypersensitivity or that volume knob. This was just a more recent study, and really to you it's just kind of like a pretty picture. But this is a brain, and what they did is they looked at that same scale, that fibromyalgia scale that gives you the score from 0 to 31, and they found that the more severe your score, meaning the, your fibromyalgia is high, that you actually had more activation of your brain. So there's actually correlates with how severe your pain is to how much your brain is being activated in those pro-pain regions. So just to summarize the brain findings a little bit, what we see is that brains of patients with fibromyalgia amplify pain signals by sending more blood flow and more neural activity to the parts of the brain that increase pain and less blood flow and less neural processing to the areas of the, the brain that actually fight pain or anti-pain. All right, who wants to take a little quiz? Did you guys think you were gonna come here and take a test? No. I'm gonna give you one. All right. These are knees. These are x-rays of knees. This is a normal x-ray of a knee, and this is bone on bone severe osteoarthritis of the knee. Which of these two people do you think has pain? If you think it's the left side, raise your hand. If you think it's the right side, raise your hand. It's a trick question, y'all. It's both, okay? We actually know that about 40% of people with this x-ray will have no pain. And this is what we're taught in medicine, is if you see something on x-ray, well, it must be causing the pain. But we know from epide uh, epidemiologic studies that about 40% of people with severe osteoarthritis may not feel pain in that joint. But you can be sure as heck that a fibromyalgia patient might have a normal x-ray of the knee, but boy, is their knee hurting. 
So that's, this is a trick question. And this is why x-rays can't guide us a lot of the times when it comes to treatment for fibromyalgia, because you can have a perfectly normal knee on x-ray, but your fibromyalgia is making your knee hurt. Okay, so what, what is, why is all this so important? Why am I telling you about this fibromyalgia in a scale and centralized pain? And it's because it influences treatment. That's why. Imagine you, you have this, this x-ray of your knee and you go see, you, you know, your GP sends you to an orthopedic surgeon, think maybe you need a knee replacement, right? And the surgeon comes in and he's like, yep, your knee hurts. I can fix it with surgery. However, <laughs> I see this all the time. What if this was the patient? What if this was the patient? What if that orthopedic surgeon took the time to find out more about the patient and say, well, your knee hurts, but so does everything else. I mean, there's, I wish I could leave this up here for a long time because it's actually really funny, like some of the things like orgasmic headaches and it's, it, it's actually really funny. This is actually a real patient from one of my colleagues at the University of Michigan. But this highlights that doctors are very siloed in our treatment, right? So if you see a surgeon for a knee that has arthritis, he's gonna be like, you have arthritis, I will fix it, without taking the rest of you into consideration. So differentiating pain that is more centralized, just like the person I just showed you, that intake form, could provide some important information on how that person should be treated. And there's actually some really good research coming out of the University of Michigan where they're looking at people who have that x-ray and go see a surgeon and get told they need a knee replacement. So they took these people and they enrolled them into a study and they did extensive questionnaires to try and get a picture of all the global things about fibromyalgia. So they get the fibromyalgia skirt surveys, they find out they're fibromyalgianists, depression surveys, functioning surveys, catastrophizing surveys, all of the things that come in that picture of the fibromyalgia phenotype. They do the quantitative sensory testing and they do the functional neuroimaging. And in this study, they had two particular outcomes of interest. So they looked at the people before surgery, determined their fibromyalgia and then followed them after surgery for six months and they were looking at how much pain medication, because in the United States, I don't know if you know, but we have a major, major opioid crisis going on. Um, 115 people in America die each day from an opioid overdose. It is astounding and it's, it's sad. There are some uh, morgues, like in Ohio, um, a morgue is, do you use that word here? Okay. Um, uh, in Ohio and West Virginia, where it's so many people were dying every day that they didn't have room to put the bodies. It's that bad. So opioids are a big, big thing that we're studying now because we're trying to make sure that we treat people the right way. I don't think in any other country we, they use opioids the way we do in America. So they looked at post-operative opioid consumption. So this is actually uh, the distribution of the patients in the study and their fibromyalgia survey scores. So zero means they have no fibromyalgianists. 31 obviously means that they have a lot of fibromyalgia. And as you can see, this population, this red line here is the cut point for a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. So everybody to the right of the line does not or does meet criteria for fibromyalgia, and everybody to the left does not. So most of this population did not meet criteria for fibromyalgia, but they were kind of distributed in this what you would call sub-fibromyalgia range. What they found doing some statistical analyses that for every one point increase in that fibromyalgia score, they would use nine milligrams more of morphine during their hospitalization, and that they would have a 20 to 25 greater likelihood of not getting any significant pain relief from that knee surgery, which is astounding, because you would think this person has knee, you know, bone on bone, knee osteoarthritis, you remove the joint, you put in a new one, they should be fixed, right? What this is telling us is that the amount of centralized pain or fibromyalgia that someone has doesn't even mean that they meet criteria for fibromyalgia 
that they are less likely to respond to these surgical interventions to treat things out in the periphery. And they found that it was actually independent of classical psychological factors, again, heralding that thing that this is about, this is a brain pain disorder. This is not at all influenced by depression or anxiety, again, signaling that this is in your head, it's just in your brain, okay? You're not making this up. So we're gonna move on to treatment, uh, integrated approach. I know that Ursula kind of touched on this, that it's not just about the pills, it's not just about the physiotherapy, it's not just about complementary. You have to do them together. You need a comprehensive and multidisciplinary approach to treating this, and that's why I say pharmacologic, I use the medications in my practice all the time, but I typically am doing it alongside a whole host of other things such as physical therapy, exercise, meditation, pain psychology. And I find that it takes a little bit of cheerleading on my part because by the time the patients come to me, they're downtrodden. They've seen like eight different doctors who don't know what they're doing and they're literally like, I've had patients come in the room and just kind of look at me like this. Like, what's this lady gonna do for me that's different than everybody else? Well, you just happen to walk into like Dr. McPersonalities, you know, I, I'm a cheerleader for people because a lot of people are so downtrodden and they've lost their support networks that they don't feel motivated to even try and get better anymore because they've had so many tries of trying to get better and then the doctor just shoves them aside when they can't get better that sometimes all you need is like a hug from a lady from Kansas to feel better, right? I mean, I think hugs give you a little boost of that, that oxytocin hormone like, you know, when you're breastfeeding your baby or you're like, you know, having a really, it's just that human touch is so important. But I find that those patients who are enthusiastic and motivated and inspired to get better are the ones that do. But the most important piece of information is that the change can't happen overnight. And I tell my patients, this is not a sprint, or uh, yeah, it's not a sprint, okay? It's a marathon. And there are times that I've had to work with people for up to over like a year, slowly, baby steps, pacing yourself. You know, I have a lot of patients who want to get back to like running a 5K or doing whatever because they used to. Not recognizing that tomorrow I'm going to ask you to walk from here to there and we're going to start with that. The next day I want you to walk a little bit further and a little bit further. And it's going to hurt at first, but I call it the good hurt. When you have not been exercising, you've been sedentary for so long, your body's muscles do something called atrophy. They get smaller. So you do have to work on kind of slow baby steps towards getting better so you can condition your body again. And once you do, you will find that you can do more and more. So I like this chart because a lot of patients with fibromyalgia, especially those who are aging, uh, can have more than just centralized pain going on. You know, we do get those knees that look like that, and it could be causing the pain in fibromyalgia patients. So this chart is really nice because it puts pain into three different buckets. Nociceptive pain, neuropathic pain, and centralized pain. So nociceptive pain comes from inflammation or damage. Neuropathic pain comes from uh, nerve damage or entrapment. And then centralized pain, as we've talked about already, I'm not gonna go over it again. But you can see that the treatment options for each different type of pain are very, very different. And you can have one of them, you can have two of them, you could have all of them. So it's very important as a patient that your doctor tries to delineate which bucket or buckets you live in and treat them accordingly. Otherwise, your doctor is doing your, you a, a grave disservice in my opinion. So it's a rather busy slide. I'm gonna try and go through it. These are all the different neurotransmitters that can influence pain. So on the left side here, you can see that these are things that generally facilitate pain transmission. Glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter, so is substance P, a nerve growth factor, and serotonin. What we know about patients with fibromyalgia doing studies is that all of those are increased. 
So essentially, if you have an increased level of these neurotransmitters, you're gonna facilitate or make more pain. On the right side is things that generally inhibit pain transmission. And th this is related to what you're called your descending antinociceptive pathway. So your brain has the ability to amplify pain, but it also has the ability to dampen it or make it less. So in patients with fibromyalgia, things like norepinephrine, even endogenous opioids, uh, which are things we call like endorphins, are less in patients with fibromyalgia. Although there's some new emerging research that patients with fibromyalgia are actually, they think maybe have an excess of endorphins. And that sounds strange, right? Because endorphins make you feel good. But we're thinking too much of a good thing is actually a bad thing, and we'll talk about it in just a second. So doctors can choose treatments that target all of these different alterations. And I'm just gonna point out, one of them here is called low-dose naltrexone. And I know, I think, I know of at least one person in the room who's taking it. Has anybody else taken this medication? This is a really new and emerging therapy based on that kind of idea that there's too much opioid in the body, that the body is making too much of its own opioids because what naltrexone does is it actually blocks opioids. And again, just kind of a, a summary slide here. Strong evidence means that there's a lot of literature and good research to support it, and it's generally favorable and positive. So these are things that are like antidepressants, tricyclic antidepressants, amitriptyline. Has anybody in here been on amitriptyline? Causes all sorts of side effects, huh? Yeah, it's pretty gnarly. Uh, there are newer versions of amitriptyline that may be available, such as nortriptyline or desipramine that your doctors could look into. Selective nor norepinephrine uh, reuptake inhibitors can be used, things like duloxetine or Cymbalta. Is that available here in this country? Do you guys have Savella or mil Milnasopran? So it's like the newer like sister drug of Cymbalta. It's, it's available in the United States, but it's very, very costly. Mm -hmm. And then Venlafaxine, which is Effexor. Uh, gabapentinoids, pregabalin, also known as Lyrica, um, which for some people can be helpful, but some people not. And then gabapentin, which is kind of like its older brother drug. It's been around for a really long time. And these are typically anti-seizure medications, but they work on reducing that hypersensitivity because they're what we call a membrane stabilizer. So they're trying to stabilize the, act, the overactive firing of the nerves in your body. Modest evidence for tramadol, uh, low-dose naltrexone, cannabinoids. Is, is that available here, cannabinoids? No? We wacky people in the United States are starting to legalize it everywhere. <laughs> Strangely enough, it's reducing opioid use, but it's, but it's increasing like car accidents and other stuff. <laughs> Silly Americans. Okay, weak, ev weak evidence for these right here, and then there's no evidence for, at least for standalone fibromyalgia for things like opioids or taking chronic steroids. So we've kind of discussed about that low-dose naltrexone and why that has been thought to be helpful for fibromyalgia. And they've actually been doing some studies looking at MRIs of the brain. And what they found is that patients with fibromyalgia have less receptors to take in the opioid and bind it and cause pain relief. So this may be why, I don't know if any of you have ever had a surgery where they did give you some pain medications that are opioids they work less effectively in fibromyalgia patients because you just have less of the dang receptor for the drug to go into. That's why the low-dose naltrexone is helping because it's helping actually block your endogenous opioids and help you make more receptors. So if you have more receptors, you can fight more pain. So it's pretty cool emerging research. Um, these are just some great non-pharmacologic -pharma therapies. I don't know why it got cut off here, but education, physical therapy, exercise, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is something that like a clinical psychologist or a social work counselor could do. Um, all of these have very strong evidence for supporting and helping treat fibromyalgia. And at least in the States, and I'm guessing here too, access and compliance with these things, especially the access piece, is so difficult. I see a lot of patients who are on either federal or state kind of government funded uh, insurance. And a lot of times I have trouble getting this stuff for my patients. And it's so sad because they're the ones that need it the most. This is actually something you can access yourself and it is free. 
and it was developed by the University of Michigan. Again, I keep repeating University of Michigan, but they're like the world experts in fibromyalgia research, and I'm lucky enough to get to work with them. It's, it's cut off here, but it's fibroguide.med.umich.edu, and it's essentially a online cognitive behavioral therapy module. So if you yourself can't get to a pain psychologist or a psychologist who can do cognitive behavioral therapy, you can go online and access it. And they actually did some studies looking at patients who did this versus just conventional management. And they found that uh, the patients who used this had 29% uh, reduction versus 8% reduction in their pain scores compared to just usual care. So it does seem to be helpful. These are some complementary and alternative medicine techniques, which I think you guys are gonna learn a bit, little bit about like Tai Chi a little bit later. Qi Gong meditation is kind of like a, a Eastern medicine practice of uh, meditative practice. We have a couple studies at my university ongoing looking at that. And then this is more of just a summary slide I give this to doctors all the time about how they should focus treatment. So pharmacologic therapies should be aimed at the symptoms and then non-pharmacologic therapies to address the dysfunction. And when you do all of these together, when you have that integrated multi multidisciplinary care, you'll get better because your symptoms are being managed as is your dysfunction. If you only focus on drugs, you're not gonna address the other things that are causing you difficulties on a daily basis. So it really has to be integrated and complementary. And then again, this is another summary slide with those buckets of nociceptive neuropathic and centralized pain and what drugs have been shown to be beneficial for them. And I think in terms of like closing kind of comments here about what I see as being kind of the, the wave of the future in my specialty is something called personalized analgesia. And we think that by taking patients and giving them extensive questionnaires, maybe even looking at their genetics in the future, this is that thumb squisher I told you about. It's, it's kind of looks like a gun or I'm not sure, but like a, a joystick, but we put people's thumbs in there and it squeezes on them. It gives us pain threshold readings. But we think that by taking this information about patients, that we may be in a, even the fMRI, it's very expensive, but we think one day it might be used in clinical the clinical realm, that we can then tailor specific therapies for patients based on how they look on all these different measures. Because right now, I stand before you and tell you I'm one of those doctors who still has to say, well, I guess we'll try this first. And I hope that one day I can stand up here and tell you that I have a better way to approach treating patients' pain. Uh, all I know is I give it an integrated approach and that's all I've got right now. I think in terms of avenues for further research, this concept of traumatic events I think is really important and I'm not gonna make anybody raise their hands in this room to say whether or not they've had a traumatic event, but you can think to yourself if you've had and think, gee, when that had happened, if someone had intervened, could I have prevented this? And there's actually good research coming out of Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City where they have an amplified pain clinic for children and adolescents. And they're actually finding that intense physiotherapy and psychological, like cognitive behavioral therapy, music therapy, yoga, acupuncture, all of those modalities, when they intervene in a young person, it gets better. And so there must be something about when the brain switches from adolescence to adulthood that that ability to really get in there and fix it is gone. And so I think that's a huge avenue for research that is hopefully going to be you know, hashed out in the near future. Obviously, looking at personalized treatment plans and understanding how monotherapy or combination therapy could be better than one or the other. And then obviously the impact, the societal impact of multidisciplinary care. I'd just like to leave you with some hope. I, I wish I could come here to Ireland. I wish I could treat all of the fibromyalgia patients in the world. I'd love to give all of you a hug and just tell you that I'm here and I listen and I care. Um, and hopefully you will find a physician here in Ireland that will appropriately diagnose, provide referrals and treatment options for you. I think the number one thing is maintaining that positive attitude and, and remembering Dr. Nichols, my cheerleader, even if she lives in Kansas, she's my cheerleader.
find support. I think it's so wonderful what Fibro Ireland and Arthritis Ireland has going here. We do not have anything like this in the States. The fact that you have this support network and education and outreach with advocacy is honestly inspiring. Like I, I might even get a little emotional when I leave here today because this is just really great. Um, so keep motivated to reduce your disability and improve your functioning. And then I'm going to butcher this. <laughs> I'd like to give a big shout out to Brian Lynch for giving me like the, the Kansas like pronunciation guide. So, Vishay Moore, Pivlade, Uga Sonori, Dam Lauer, Dib, Garev Magav.